Hello and welcome to today's Stilo podcast. Joining me is Perry, who is our design engineer here at Stilo. Hi. Um, yeah, um, it's good to be here. Excited to yeah. talk. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Perry, if you could, uh, let's go right to the beginning. Yep. How did you join us uh, here at Stilo? Uh, I joined straight out of uni, essentially. So I joined in August of 2020. Uh, finished uni, was still working part time at the petrol station I was at, but hmm. wanted to do something, you know, with, with actual interest and something I had interest in. So I started applying. I knew I wanted a CAD based role, something where I can actually model, and that's what I like doing. So I applied to Stilo, and you know, here I am. So what what are your main tasks? What what tools do you use? So daily on um, daily tasks that I have is mainly using Tecla, uh, steel. Uh, it's, it's a specialized uh, software for steel work. Hmm. Um, it's very. Well, I think it's very sort of straightforward. Everything is like you know designed for you. Um, that's my main set of tasks. But of course, like with a designer's role, you get like you know uh, problems that pop up with regards to fabrication, material. Uh, um, ordering so it's really a variety of different yeah, things yeah. yeah okay so let's break it down slightly so with Tecla how does it differ from AutoCAD because I get you do have some AutoCAD yes. experience yes. so what's what's the difference so AutoCAD the way I like to see it is AutoCAD is a bit more general so it, it yeah. allows you to sort of get across any concept pretty quickly because it is a very sort of straightforward software to use Tecla is specifically designed for steelwork. So anything to do with steelwork, Tecla has got that in the books. So that's why Tecla is much more preferred in the industry, or it's much more easy for us designers and steel designers to use this because there's no fiddling about with anything because AutoCAD, you would have to manually go in there and change parameters. While Tecla, you click one point, another point, you've got a beam ready there in front of you. So it's very easy. For us. But then do you have to put in the shape of each section like do you have to draw the shapes individually or are they no. part of a like there's a part of a catalog so mm. we, we have a catalog which we can actually add to so if we for example we don't have a beam in this catalog we can manually uh, add it in but yeah it's a, it's a huge catalog full of all the plate profiles and beam profiles you'll need to design any structure mm. and we go on from there and the connections how connections, do the connections work uh there are custom macros that we have uh, mm. at Stilo so design the design engineers have designed specific macros for whatever connection we will ever need uh, and these have been input into the software directly so we just click a button click two beams and depending on what connection you want it's right there in front of you and then you can go into each connection and change let's say the bolt spacing the bolt size mm. so it's all very smooth for us and it's parameterized so if you need to change the spacing between the bolts you just Adjust I mean, a few numbers yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay. And how do you know what what to draw? Meaning, where do you get the information from? Um, from two sources. So one from the client's engineer drawings, if they have this from their, uh, let's say, uh, structural engineer, mm. um, and the other one is from our sales team. Um, so they will often simplify a drawing for us if it's not if it's too messy on the structural engineer side, which often it is. Um, or they or they just like sort of highlight the points that we need to model. So using these two, we can generate a drawing. Um, and it's good because if there's any discrepancies between the two, we're able to talk to the client and be like, okay, so which would you rather have? And that's what that's why it's so important to have this role. Yeah. And then once you produce the model, what happens next in the process? Uh, so the model's done. You generate the drawings for fabrication. Um, you order the material. And we have a very specific layout for the uh, drawing so that uh, when we hand it over to fabrication, they know exactly what's what and what needs to be done. So there's plates that need to be fabricated. And then these plates are then given over to the welders. Welders, you know, gather the beams and the plates, weld them together, and that's it. Okay. And when it comes to CNC data, how, mm -hmm. how do you export that? Uh, we have uh, another macro, an NC file macro, where we click on it and all the info of the model is essentially transferred onto our V550 and V600 machines from Wartman. And so production will be immediately be able to tell what they need to fabricate. So they have it downstairs, they find the matching documents mm. that we hand them, and then they drill the beam or the plate. And if something does go wrong, what what, what is the issue normally? The most common issue in design? Yeah. Uh, let's see. The most common issue in design is probably... I'd say dimensions. So often we get like either we overlook dimensions or material that we get in from suppliers is off by five mils or mm. something like this. So that's why it's important when we get, that's why we give the production, um, the drawings in advance so that they're able to check each beam that comes in and measure it. 
and see whether it's okay because you can understand that if it's five mils off before fabrication after fabrication it's going to be a bit more off yeah. the whole thing is going to be messed up so it's essential that we check each element before fabrication begins and how do you make sure that what you produce is correct meaning you didn't mix up the dimensions or oh. you got the height of the columns yeah. wrong me personally i have this system that i've been using since i joined Stilo. i mm. highlight every detail on the paperwork okay. so that i go i go through each paperwork everything i have from sales and i highlight with a green highlighter to make sure i told, I told myself right i've done that and i check it on the model and do it about two times so that nothing's missed yeah yeah, yeah. so going back through all the projects you've you've done so far which yep. one was the most exciting one or the one you're most proud of uh, it's funny because there's one that I just finished like two days ago, which I've been working on for three months. I think we've mentioned it in the huddle. Um, it's one of, um, it's basically a roof for a, uh, for a building, which is near my mm. parents' house, funnily enough. Um, but I've been working on it for three months. And what's funny is the client didn't know what he wanted. Yeah. So he came to us and he said, I want a roof and I've got basic dimensions. I've just got the, the width and the length of the structure. And he didn't know the angle for the roof. He didn't know anything. So for me, it was, it was my job to sort of, like have a look at the engineer drawings, see the proposed design. Mm. And from that sort of generate my idea of what I think the roof could be like. And then from there on, he used these my drawings, sent it to a structural engineer, calculations came back and there's a lot of back and forth, but eventually it got confirmed. And I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah. yeah. I didn't yeah. think I'd see the end of it, but. Oh, well, you should go to your side to see it. Yeah, I should, I should. Yeah. I should. It's, it's and you said it's next to your parents' house? Yes, yes, yes. So I was thinking about going down there at one point just... Oh, you're going to have to yeah, we'll have visit to. your parents yeah. one day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so on the, other, on the other side of the spectrum, which was the most dreaded job or the one you really um, didn't job. enjoy? It's tough. Um, well, there was one, I think, it's more about the lack of experience I had at the start, which made... Mm few more jobs a bit more daunting for me there was one around christmas 2020 i believe um i was a lot less experienced but it's jobs like those i can't remember what the job was but it's jobs like that that allow me to sort of learn more like that's why i always tell the designers as well like it's jobs that make it tough for you hmm. that make it worthwhile because you know you're learning in that process the mistakes you make in those big jobs are the ones that you will not make in the future so it's so what's your biggest screw up my biggest screw up oh geez there's been a few cranks cranks were sort of my kryptonite at the start i have to say uh because it was like coming straight out of uni like it was it was daunting to see this angle you know these yeah. it's very it's very like because there's a lot of, a lot of work that goes into these angled beams um but that was i made a few mistakes at the start but i remember leader who was design team leader at the time she was really helpful sat down with me and she was like, okay i'm gonna tell you exactly what you need to know the cranks and i think after that was pretty smooth yeah 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 and you mentioned that in the past you you wanted a cad role yes how did you know you wanted a can roll? Um, well, it's it's funny because okay, I've always played around Blender. I don't know if you Blender and mm. all these like free like three D modeling softwares. I, yeah. I always used to play around that just for fun. I used to make all these like models based on video game characters or movie yeah. characters I used to see. But I also loved architecture and like buildings and stuff like this. So I thought to myself, how would I be able to sort of maybe mix both of these interests together? And then I found the design engineering. Uh, course at uh, University of Greenwich hmm. so that allowed me to sort of play around with conceptual modeling but also practical use in real life industries um, and that's sort of where I went on and uh, literally every day at my uni was just modeling just CAD work I used Rhino AutoCAD SolidWorks and they really let us play around with everything yeah yeah how about robots because because you mentioned before that yes. you have, have been involved in robots yes so what uh, at, uh, at uni what what we did was depending on what your course was they'd assign they put a team together uh, for coursework projects and um, so each of these teams would have a different engineer with different mm -hmm. role and we had a project where we had to design a robot which is able to go up to a small fire and put it out. So it was a, an automated fire robot you could think of it. And my job as design engineer was to make a 3D model for it, a CAD model um, with all the labels and drawings, pretty much what I do here, but just a lot yeah, more conceptual. Yeah. Um, and then the structural engineers or whatever, civil engineers have to calculate the the water and you know yeah. how much it would shoot out and stuff like this. So um, that's that was my first interest in robotics, like this idea of actually generating something that can do a task by itself, you know, without any input. Um, but that's pretty much it. I'm also into all this Boston Dynamics stuff. You know, I'm always looking at their videos because yeah. that's like mind blowing. But so, what do you like most about Boston Dynamics? 
Um, I like seeing the progress videos. Like, have you see, if you see the stuff from the like two thousands, yeah, this yeah. is very basic. Like, it looks kind of funny looking at it now, but now I don't know if you've seen these videos of the obstacle courses yeah, that yeah. these robots can go across. And to me, it's mind blowing because for each step that that robot is taken, there, there's like lines and lines of coding that we can't see, but it's there. And so, like, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not skilled in that the coding part of you know, Walker yeah, yeah. way better than me in understanding that kind of stuff, but. I just really find it interesting. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen the clip where the guy is using a hockey stick to yes, to yes, yes, knock yes. the box out yeah. of, of the hands of robots? And he's, yeah. it's like really struggling. It calculates everything. Like it, it knows. Ah, oh, it's just yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's your biggest challenge now uh, in your role as a design engineer? Uh, biggest challenge now is sort of I'd say recently we've been taking on a lot more larger projects, hmm. and I think the challenge now is trying to find a way for uh, not just me but for the whole department of design to make sure that these are done smoothly and efficiently because it's well recently we've had like some some sort of hiccups and it's allowed us to sort of look back and go right okay clearly we need to re rethink some processes here so what do you mean by by rethinking the processes um, for large projects so we 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 think that it's best if we split these large projects into smaller chunks because that because we deal with small to medium chunks daily that's what yeah. usually mm -hmm. project size is so when we get the large projects trying to do it as a large project does not work for us because we don't have these processes in place and it, it will just mess everything up so we think we've decided that splitting them up will allow us to treat treat one large project as three medium projects let's say yeah and it allows us to go a lot smoother as opposed to ordering 200 beams for one day and being stuck on production with, okay, where do we go now? So, you know. Yeah, which happened and we did have a huddle on the material. On the actual material, yeah. yeah. Oh so, so much material arriving. And I guess the same principle applies to everyday life. Like yeah, when people say they want to clear the garage, it's a daunting task straight away. Whereas if you just start by one shelf, yeah. then it becomes a manageable exactly, task. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. How about your artistic side? Because because you're great at drawing. Do oh, you do you okay. still do any of that? Yeah, I try to do at least a sketch a day. It's a okay. habit that I got into while I was doing art for A level. Mm. And my teacher was like, "Do a sketch a day or do something a day." And he said, "It's not to, you don't have to do something beautiful. It's to get your idea on paper." So I watch. I go to a lot of galleries and mm. I listen to a lot of artists, and they always say that you know while other people have journals or some sort of like you know, book list that they write. For artists, it's a sketchbook. It's it's to get an idea down what you're thinking of that day. So at home, I've got six, seven that I've collected over like since 2018 wow. of just sketchbooks. So if people come around my house, you can have a look at them. But they're not like amazing sketches. They're just ideas, what I was thinking that day, what I was feeling that day. Yeah. So what was your recent sketch about? Recently, I've actually started doing sketches of the design engineers so i thought design the office needed a bit more color so i've been doing so we had a we have a scoreboard up um of how many x points we get a day and i thought it looked a bit too militaristic a bit too boring a bit too harsh you know yeah. oh, i don't know adam got this many x points and it's just his name on top so i did a portrait for all the designers and i said okay here's your portraits and here's your points it looks a bit more fun are they portraits or character like portraits yeah portraits, and portraits yeah. yeah it looks like them but i just added a bit of color and stuff so yeah, yeah. that was yeah. my most recent but also i took part in inktober i don't know if you know about inktober no nope. so every october like artists all over the world are encouraged to every day you get a prompt a preset mm. prompt list by the organization so let's say the second of october the prompt word might be something like scurry and you have to draw or sketch something in that using that prompt. Okay. So people who and everybody takes part. Industrial designers take part, and they might do like an industrial robot, which is designed to like scurry or something. Yeah. yeah. Abstract artists take part, and they do some weird complex stuff. So do you sell your art? Do you present it no, somewhere? I've thought about it, but I'm, I've had a chat with my fiance about it, like whether I could sell it. I've looked at like different venues and stuff, but for now I'm just going to do it for fun. But yeah. yeah. But maybe maybe in the future, once I like actually, I don't know, have a distinct style because that's what people look for. They yeah. look for some something individualistic about you. So yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. So going back to Stilo, uh, you've also got the role of a CNC coordinator. Yes. What what does that entail? Essentially, ensuring that the machines are running smoothly because um, these machines are complex. I mean, you can imagine like it's. And they're working pretty much from the start to the end of the mm. day. They don't stop. They're drilling, they're cutting constantly. And for my role, it's like, basically, it's just ensuring that regular maintenance is upheld, making sure that no component is going bust, essentially. Like, 
um, as soon as the operators let me know that there's a bit of you know a bit of efficiency loss in the machines we open the machine up we have a look at what could be the issue so what was today's issue about today's issue uh, holes were being drilled two millimeters off now we've had this issue before and it's uh, from what I've, I've had a chat with Wartman and they said it could either be a sensor issue so essentially yeah. the laser is off so it's reading the wrong uh, mark point and the, the so the machine drills in the wrong place or which is a bigger issue is the bearing is off so the whole machine can you imagine the whole machine is slightly yeah. tilted at like a few like a point degree angle but it's enough to make a difference and so which today one was it? luckily the sensor or now okay. it's what we think so our, our one of our operators he went into the little com the, the computer and he adjusted it two mils so it's drilling correctly now. So we'll have to see at the end of the day if it's still like this. If it's not, it means it's the mechanical. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Thanks, Perry, very much for today's no conversation. And remember to subscribe so that you don't miss out on our future podcasts. Thank you. Thank you.